Howdy folks, I'm Oscillating Osmium, outrageously ousting ornery ocelots. I'm Sally. And here are more ornery ocelots for us to oust. I don't know why we are, but apparently we don't like them. Let's get started. Alright folks, and our first letter is titled, Am I a jerk for gifting my twins differently on their birthday? So recently, my son and daughter, who are 18-year-old twins, just celebrated their birthdays, and I got them gifts accordingly. However, my daughter got really upset about the gift that she received compared to her brother, and now she won't talk to me. Here's the deal. For my son's birthday, I bought him a car. It's a used one, nothing fancy, but it's a reliable vehicle that gets him around. On the other hand, for my daughter's birthday, I gifted her a $300 Visa gift card. Now, I understand that on the surface, this might seem a bit unfair, but hear me out. My son has shown strong interest in cars for years, and he's been saving up for one. He's responsible and has a part-time job, so I thought that it was a good time to help him get one. He was thrilled, and we even went car shopping together. My daughter, on the other hand, never expressed any particular interest in anything specific. She's more into shopping and fashion, which is why I thought that the Visa gift card would give her the freedom to choose whatever she wants. Plus, she's been asking for extra money lately to buy clothes and makeup. However, when she opened up her gift, she got visibly upset and called it unfair. She said that it wasn't fair that her brother got a car and she only got a gift card and that I was showing favoritism. I tried explaining my reasoning to her, but she wouldn't listen and stormed out of the room. She hasn't talked to me since. I think what I did was best for each of them based on their interests and needs. But now I'm wondering, was I in the wrong? All right, folks, what do you think? Was OP in the wrong? Absolutely. Uh, unless it was a $300 car, which OP says in the comments that it cost $10,000. Uh, and even if the son paid for part of it, I I'm guessing he didn't pay $9,700 of the card. Now, you don't have to give your kids exactly identical gifts all the time, but they should have fairly similar monetary amounts or else you're going to end up showing favoritism. Well, exactly. I mean, I think that it was all right to get your son a car and your daughter a you know gift card of some form, but it does need to be close to equal monetary value. And there are, of course, exceptions to this. Like, say, for instance, had you set up some kind of deal between them that if they maintained good grades and got part-time jobs and some other things that you would reward them with, like, a gift of a car, then that would have been something that they both could have achieved for or strove for, whereas it just seems like this is out of the blue. Yeah. Like, while you might think that your son deserves a car more than your daughter, you never gave her the opportunity to prove why she does or doesn't deserve a car well exactly in the comments op is just generically like well i wanted to reward my son but there's no indication that the daughter is doing anything like she's just being a different human being and it seems like op just likes their son better it, it seems it seems it smacks of blatant favoritism yeah but let me know what you folks think so anyhow take care and good luck and our next letter is titled, Am I a jerk for doing what my partner said I do? I'm a 24-year-old female and my partner is a 29-year-old male. And we've been living together for a while and we have a daughter, year and a half. Then I work part-time and he works full-time. So I do most of the household chores. Recently, he has been saying that I don't do anything and that I get to chill at home all day with our daughter. He doesn't seem to notice any of the work I do around the house. So I stopped. This wasn't my first reaction, and I did try to talk to him, but he's adamant that it doesn't take that much to look after the toddler and clean the house. After literally months of trying to get him to see how much I actually do, I decided just to stop doing it. I still clean up after myself and our daughter. He started complaining how there's so much mess, all left by him, and how he doesn't have any clean uniform or underwear. All of this came to a head when I had to go to the hospital appointment and he spent all day looking after our daughter and had to do some cleaning and tidying. When I got home, he was furious because he had done so much and was exhausted. Apparently, our daughter had pretty much followed him around all day and doing all the work that he had done. 
exactly what she does for me. Instead of realizing what goes on into keeping a house clean and looking after a toddler, he blamed me for not being on top of everything and leaving everything for him. All that was left was his mess. So am I the jerk for leaving his mess for him? All right, folks, what do you think? No, I don't think Opie's being a jerk here. And I think her partner is being really cruel. I mean, he simultaneously is saying, when you do work, it's easy. When I do this exact same work, it's somehow hard and exhausting. Yeah. And these two things are not simultaneously true. It's either the cleaning is actually hard and valuable work, or it's not. And I think it's pretty clear that it's the former. Marriage counseling. <laughs> I mean, if it can even salvage the things at this point in time. But... Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'd start thinking about divorce if he values you so little and you've had repeated conversations trying to get him to understand your contribution to the household. I think that raising a child is difficult. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of energy and it can make parents exhausted. And I'm hoping that he's operating under exhaustion and it's clouding his judgment. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> now, I don't know if that necessarily is the case. And I think that he is taking OP for granted, right? And I understand OP's actions here. They're hoping to show him by example why it isn't as easy as he says it is. And I don't think that OP is going to win in this situation. Her husband thinks that he's poor, put upon, and oppressed, and he's, that nothing is going to change his mind short of sitting down and having uh, probably counseling with somebody who can help him to see that he is actually being unreasonable. And the tough thing is it has to be someone that he respects and trusts. Mm -hmm. And like finding someone who is going to be fair and present the information in a way that um, is actually going to be appealing to him is going to be a very difficult thing. And that's why I'm not convinced counseling is necessarily going to work because he has to be open to it. Yeah. And if he's not open to therapy, then I mean, I don't think that this is going to be a worthwhile endeavor. And I think that OP needs to decide what is best for them at this point in time, if this continues to escalate and gets worse. And then it might be time to say, look, you know, if you think that you can do this all on your own, then maybe we should just go our separate ways and then you can have the kid for half the time and I can have the kid for half the time and you can see how, how little work I really do. But let me know what you folks think. So anyhow, take care and good luck. All right, folks, and our next letter is titled, Am I a jerk for telling my niece that she'll have to move out if she's not my nanny anymore? I'm a single mom to two kids, eight and six. I work as a nurse three days a week. I work 12 hour shifts from 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. After my husband passed, I needed a nanny to tend to my kids from the time that they got off at school, 3 p.m. onwards. I decided a live-in nanny was the best choice. I have one guest bedroom. I live right near the university. Around this time, my niece had just gotten accepted. She wanted to save costs on dorms and offered to watch my kids for those three days if she could live there rent free. I agreed and said that I would also pay her $22 an hour, which is a competitive rate for our area. She's done with her classes by one, so it works out. She fixes them dinner and then puts them to bed. She's also free to do whatever, but of course I pay her from 3 p.m. to 12 a.m. It's worked for two years. My niece never had any complaints. Now, however, my niece is getting a paid internship related to her major that starts January. She won't be available to watch my kids. I congratulated her and said that I could help her look into student housing or an apartment. We have three months to do this. She was confused. I said since I would need a live-in nanny and only have one guest room, she would have to move out. My niece got upset and said that it isn't fair that she won't be able to save any money if she gets a dorm or an apartment. She could afford to live on her own, but wouldn't have much savings. I pointed out that this would work best for me as I've had to put my kids in aftercare the other two days that I work. I get off around five and a nanny could just pick them up from school versus having them to stay there for so long. My niece argued that the nanny could leave at the end of her shift, but after speaking to some nannies, they understandably don't want to drive home so late. Plus, I'm fine with a nanny and my niece sleeping after the kids do. So there's no sense in them sleeping and then waking up and then driving drowsy. Even I feel nervous driving home so late, especially after my long shift. My sister-in-law, her mom, 
feels that this is unfair to my niece, but she moved in under the condition that she work as a live-in nanny. My sister-in-law and brother live three hours away, so my niece couldn't commute if she moved back in with them. They feel that I should try to find a nanny who would be willing to drive home at 12.30 a.m. It would take me a half hour minimum to get home. But all nannies that I've spoken to have said no or expressed concerns about their safety driving so late. Am I the jerk? Edit to answer a question from the FAQ. The internship is all semester long. My niece isn't interested in nannying at all going forward and will instead be pursuing internships. She has no desire to work after her internship is over for the day. She knew from the jump that I was only looking for a live-in specifically for childcare. I have also provided her written notice and am covering my butt legally. All right, folks, what do you think? No, I don't think Opie's being a jerk here. I mean, she's made it clear from the get-go that she is hiring someone as a live-in nanny. And if niece stops doing that job, OP needs someone to fill that role. I mean, I understand the niece being upset, right? Because this wasn't probably something that she thought of. She wasn't really thinking that, oh, I would lose my place of uh, stay. But she should have been, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that she should have absolutely had on her mind because the conditions of her staying there are that she is a live-in nanny. So I don't think that OP is in the wrong because that's the conditions and OP can't, just cannot afford to have it any other way. She can't leave her kids unsupervised and no nanny is going to agree to drive home at 12.30 a.m. every day, right? But let me know what you folks think. So anyhow, take care and good luck. All right, folks, and our next letter is titled, Am I a jerk for leaning on my daughter for emotional support while she was on her honeymoon? Six months prior to me, a 62-year-old female's daughter, a 32-year-old female getting married, my husband, a 64-year-old male of 40 years, left me to pursue a life of alcoholism. This left me emotionally distraught, and she was the only person whom I could share my heartbreak with and lean on for support. She lived close by with her fiance and I was able to go around their house on a daily basis to air my latest grievances and let her know what her father had been up to. It was much needed cathartic experience for me and one which my mental health depended on. After the wedding, despite being able to spend much of the time at the reception explaining how uncomfortable my ex-husband's presence made me feel, my daughter and her husband were to go on a week-long honeymoon in Europe. I did not think that I could manage the solitude on my own, and so I informed my daughter that I would have to call her daily to manage. It was such a stressful time for me, and I was often in tears talking to her, and often had to call several times a day. I needed someone to hear how upset I was with my ex-husband, and how I felt that he cheated me out of the best years of my life married to this man, and she was my emotional rock. My daughter has since told me that my son-in-law was less empathetic than she was to my situation, and didn't understand why she couldn't just let us enjoy our honeymoon. Am I the jerk here, or is my son-in-law just as cold and heartless as my ex-husband? All right, folks, what do you think? OP, I think you need therapy. Yeah. Uh, you need a support system that extends beyond your daughter. And uh, OP has to remember that this is hard on her daughter, too. Like, this man is her father, so yeah. she's dealing with this situation. And then she has her mom constantly bashing on her dad the entire time. Like, it's exhausting. And it sounds like your daughter doesn't necessarily ha know how to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I know that it's hard, but you really need to start expanding your support network and start with therapy for this because this is the kind of issue that a therapist is going to be most adept to help you handle. Um, but also start looking for friends who you can share your grievances with. You know, OP, I would invest in journaling. And sometimes talking out your problems aloud is really all you need. And there's no better listener than a piece of paper. <laughs> and so maybe one of the exercises that you could do is write down the things that you resent about your ex-husband and write them down every single day and when you get done writing them down and you fill up a whole notebook go outside and burn the whole thing and just kind of let go of that resentment and i mean i think that that right there is going to be an exercise that's going to help you kind of get over your resentment towards the situation remember your 
ex-husband is has a substance use disorder. He isn't being an alcoholic by a choice. No one is out there being like, I, w I wish I was an alcoholic, right? No one wants that for themselves. He is a person who is struggling and he has his own issues. And I understand you're hurt, but he didn't do this to hurt you. He did this because alcohol is an addictive substance that ruins people's lives when it becomes a problem like this. And I think that you're being extremely selfish towards your daughter and not paying attention to her needs. And you also have to consider that this is your your whole house of cards is built on one person. This isn't good. What happens if your daughter gets into an accident or she isn't able to talk or for one reason or another, right? Yeah, or she has kids and gets involved in her own, wrapped mm -hmm. up in her own life. Like you can't expect one single person to be your entire support network. Yeah. It's not sustainable. And it's going to leave you disappointed and feeling even more resentful. So I think that you have a lot of work to do on yourself. And I think you have to understand that the situation happened. You're a part of it. But I don't think that your ex-husband did this purposely to spite you. I don't think he went and became an alcoholic to spite you. Right. And I think it's important, too, to remember that everyone else has mental health struggles, too, in this mm -hmm. situation. And that pouring all of this onto your daughter is going to potentially exacerbate her mental health struggles she has over the situation. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a lot a lot to take in when you're constantly being bombarded multiple times a day during what's supposed to be one of the most happy times of your life. Like this honeymoon mm -hmm. is to relax, escape, enjoy their sort of married life. And they can't enjoy it as a married couple because you have to call your daughter crying multiple times a day. Yeah. So yeah, OP, I think that you, while I would hesitate to say that you're like a horrible wrong jerk, I do think that you're being selfish and you need to reevaluate your support system and reevaluate the pressure you're putting on your daughter. But let me know what you folks think. So anyhow, take care and good luck. All right, folks, it is tea time. Grab your beverages of choice. I've got some tea right here. And Amber, she apparently has a joke off the top of her head. Yes, this is adapted from a joke that Brian said the other day. Well, I told a joke the other day. Yes. I don't remember. What is a ghost's favorite type of pasta? Oh, <laughs> I'm laughing at my own punchline. <laughs> Spaghetti. Spooketty, yeah. Yeah, Spooketty. And I have Mega Mint. Oh, and thank you to whoever suggested Sally. Again, I've forgotten who suggested my costume, so I had a lot of fun with this one. Unfortunately, this is a kid's costume, and the wig is uh, children's size, and apparently I don't have a children's size head, so that didn't stay all long. <laughs> <laughs> it's squishing Amber's poor melon. Yes. All right, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching. Happy Friday, Junior. Happy Friday, Junior. Thanks to Amber for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And Amber, we need some kind of moral advice and or guidance. And please have it in the form of a fortune cookie. Favoritism breeds resentment. Share the wealth. Yeah. That's a pretty cool fortune cookie you got there. I could see right through it. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.